Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Dairy Girls Season 3, Episode 1. In this episode, the girls all decide that they are going to sneak into their school and try and find the results of a test. But the thing is, there's already somebody who is sneaking into their school. And unwittingly, they help them rob the entire place. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you so much to Ashley for commissioning this episode. So this is very exciting, y'all. I am just delighted to be back in this world. And I can't, I am, I had intended to rewatch the first two seasons before it was time to actually start season three. But because of Puppy Project, uh, it has been so hectic that I have completely forgotten. And I, once we dropped back into it, I was just like, oh man, I forgot how absolutely delightful this entire universe is. And I really do enjoy James and like, his being a part of things still considering the way the last season ended and how he really decided to like invest himself in this like weird group of friends. It's all just warming the cockles of my heart. It feels like a really great show to start rewatching around the holidays, even though it's not actually like a holiday show at all. I don't think they ever have a Christmas episode, do they? I don't, I may be mistaken on that. Um, Although I know that the Dairy Girls did like the, they did a Great British Bake Off that was Christmas themed, wasn't it? I think. So maybe I'll go watch that. That was a difficult thing to find if I remember correctly. Um, But there's just something about it that just feels so warm and familiar and just like comforting to me now. And I think it's kind of remarkable that it feels that way when it's such a short series of, of episodes per season. I haven't been immersed in this world that long compared to a lot of shows that I will have watched many, many episodes per season. And it just feels more real and more familiar to me than many shows I have spent more time watching. So I don't know. I find that like, it's the kind of thing that I have a hard time pinpointing exactly why that happens. I think it might be because the universe for the show is very small. You know, we've got like, it's an ensemble cast and you really are just within the same like group of 10 or 15 people most of the time. And that might be part of it, but it's also, I think just the uh, relatability of the plots. They're always dealing with something that feels very like, kind of low stakes in the grand scheme, although in their perspectives, of course, it feels enormous. And I think that helps as well, that what they're worried about and what their goals are, you know, given whatever episode they're in, those always feel like something I can really understand. Um, So anyway, uh, Ashley saying, yeah, the VPN situation was tricky. Yeah, that is the kind of thing that like, I know there's ways around that with, you know, things on your, on your computer and whatnot, but I don't like to watch things at my computer. I like to watch from my television and I know that there's ways to throw from my computer to my TV in the living room using Bluetooth or, you know, whatever, but it always has, there's always a problem. It never quite works. It's just such a pain. So there are people out there who just watch everything torrented and I am so jealous that they can like, just be cool with that because I feel like such an old lady where I'm like, no, I want to be in my chair in my comfy room and I don't want to be sitting at my desk or on a laptop. That's unacceptable for me. I just, I want it how I want it. And I'm just going to be very high maintenance about it. And I just have to 
you know, except that there are going to be certain sacrifices that I have to make in order to do that. So, okay. We start this episode. It is so... I love this so much. I don't know about... Because it turns out that there was like a... Another film that wound up winning an Oscar or something for... uh, It was about the Berlin Wall. And I am not familiar with whatever it is they're referencing here. I'm sure that this is a real thing. So I just want to mention off the top that I am sure that the spoofing of this would hit a lot harder if I knew what they were referencing. And I don't. So I just, you know, I know that it's going to not quite be as like on point because of that. But even not knowing the whole way that this is done is so delightful. This reminded me a lot of um, an episode of Community. <laughs> there, for those who don't know, Community has a lot of sort of themed episodes. And there was one episode where it was themed like a um, Ken Burns documentary. And they actually got Ken Burns to narrate it. And it's like documenting this feud between Troy and Abed, where they are fighting over blanket forts versus pillow forts. And there's a lot of sepia tinted photos and a lot of reading of quotes, uh, like over a slow pan, over a photograph, a still photo, things like that. And it is just extremely well done. And this really had the energy of them trying to capture something like that. We start with like the, the big sepia photo of all the girls together, really happy with Aaron's voiceover. They told us we were young yet. We understood the enormity of it and we understood what was at stake. And I think that if I'm not mistaken, I don't have the sound on obviously, I think there are like bagpipes playing over this scene and she's like in her school uniform looking at this man who is standing nearby with like an assault rifle leaning as she's just sort of leaning up against the wall. There's no, in other words, real reason for her to be here. It just feels like it's, it's her being melancholy and dramatic and it's intercut with a, uh, rosary like for a quick flash and then another flash of like some people i think gathered around a burning car our fear was replaced with something altogether more terrifying and again lots of like intercuts with james and he's like just dribbling a soccer ball Orla, who's swinging around like a lamp post in a way that feels very inappropriate to the tone of the thing. Uh, hope. Hope is so much worse. And it's then a, a really, I mean, you guys, it's just, it's so good. Claire is putting like a little crown of flowers on Michelle on like a hillside. Just just the whole way that this is set up is meant to it's like a, a an Instagram reel. You know, where it's a bunch of situations that are hugely photogenic and it's not a thing that you really believe they would ever be doing. Like Would the girls ever just hang out and make flower crowns on a random hillside? No, we know them. They would not. But for this moment and the the description of how they have hope and they're young and innocent in their way, but understand it has to be something like that. You know, it can't be them like sneaking booze or going to a concert that their parents told them they couldn't go to. So anyway, it turns out that this whole project was inspired by the video that they mentioned about the Berlin Wall. And they are trying to do something that's extremely emotionally high impact like this. And I love the whole idea of this because if there is a something that's sort of uncomfortable about the beginning stages of doing anything creative, looking back, especially it's the fact that you always are copying something and it's like 
pretty clear that you're doing it usually. There are, of course, going to be exceptions and things that you're just, you know, but a lot of times you get inspired by something very specific. And when you're young and you don't know where your own voice is or what you want to say, the urge to simply replicate the thing you love, it feels like very natural and reasonable, but it's not really you making anything of your own. It's just you taking something and tweaking it slightly. And so it's always, this is the problem, part of the problem that I had with the uh, book Aragon that I covered with the Overdue Boys, which is on both my feed, the Unspoiled Book Club feed, and it's on the Overdue feed. But that was a book written by a very young kid, and a lot of people lauded him for how young he was to have finished writing a book, which is certainly a huge achievement. I mean, as a grown-ass adult, I have never finished a book. Well, that's not true. I finished them, but they were bad. But it was such a complete Lord of the Rings ripoff, and... Of course it was. He was 15. Of course it was. It's fine. But I find it sort of tragic. That's what he got famous for because like he sort of wound up getting boxed into things at a very young age because he wasn't given the opportunity to explore other types of writing and other, you know, he was so his parents are the ones who like published his book and brought him out doing like book tours because they wanted to lean on him for their income is pretty much how it went. So their exploitation of their kid wound up sort of locking him into a fantasy genre to continue a series that maybe if he had been allowed to like have that just be an experimental thing he wrote, he could have developed a little bit more in other directions instead of immediately having to pursue a thing. Anyway, all that to be said that they are arguing about, first of all, James's camera and whether it's the problem. And this leads to Michelle saying that his mother always sends him very top of the line shit to make up for the fact that she doesn't love him. <laughs> and then when she says, Oh, I'm sorry, that came out wrong. She stops and says, I meant, and then goes, nope, can't think of another way to put it than that. And I was like, oh, man, I hate that. But honestly, there is a vibe like that's a lot of parents who are otherwise sort of neglectful will start to be like a, very generous because they figure at least that's something. Um, and I love Michelle in this scene. And oh, <laughs> Ashley's in the chat. I read Aragon before I ever got to Lord of the Rings and I thought he was absolutely genius. Yeah, see, this is it. That's really what I've noticed is that people who really loved Aragon are people who read it very young and they weren't familiar with what he was ripping off or they were, but they just wanted more of the thing. So it didn't bother them that they were ripping it off. And that's totally fine. There's a lot of stuff that I, means a lot to me that I watched or read as a kid that it was because I didn't really get that they were doing something that was sort of done already. And that's fine. It's, I think just coming at it as an adult who not only was Lord of the Rings out, but the movies and everything saturated our consciousness with it. And it was so derivative, y'all, that when they made the Aragon movie, they totally removed references to dwarves and elves entirely because they were afraid people were going to call it derivative, which like if you have to change a property that fundamentally because you're worried it's derivative, then maybe it just is and you shouldn't option it to produce it in the first place. And this, of course, led to them never making another movie because it had like three or four books at least. So they shot themselves in the foot because spoilers, there is a major like plot that depends on the concept of the elves and dwarves and deciding to just cut that out of the movie entirely pretty much means that you can't do the plot. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, I just I find the whole thing with Eric it was fascinating because um, I had no idea the backstory of it when I began to like when I agreed to cover it. And then once I started to look into it more, I was like, what on earth is this shit show? Um, but anyway, so Michelle in the scene, James is, is the one who's saying like, 
they won an Oscar for it. And I love Michelle saying, and you know, maybe they probably had something like talent. And I think we need to face the fact that we've spent the summer making something that's really quite shite. And this is what we love about her, right? Like, is she always right? No. But Michelle is very willing to say what a thing is. And I admire being willing to say, I spent a bunch of time on this thing and it's time to scrap it. It's done. That happens. You know, there are just, there are going to be things that you invest a lot of time in and do your best and it just doesn't end up good anyway. What can you do? And I understand that it also doesn't mean as much to her. This is clearly like a project that seems to be significant to James somehow, which I think is compelling considering the fact that he isn't actually Irish. And I'm wondering if that's part of it, if he has this urge to document things in this way, because it's not about him in the same sense. But I say that acknowledging, of course, that Aaron feels as invested in this as well. And when he says that the script might need a bit of work, she says, do not start on the script again. The script is a masterpiece. And then Michelle says, the script is boring, Aaron. It's like, what is it even about? And when Aaron says peace, Michelle says, I am so fucking sick of peace. It's all anyone ever bangs on about. <laughs> oh, God, Michelle is such a vibe. Truly, she is. I mean, she's right. You know, if you try and write something that is about peace, like, how does that even work exactly? You know, it, it, I understand the attempt. I understand what Aaron wants. But yeah, I'm going to go ahead and guess Michelle is correct on this. Um. And then she says, I think that we should just cut our losses and make a couple of fake videos for you've been framed. And I have no idea what this is. Ashley, if you care to, uh, you know, help me out with this, Orla immediately follows up with, I can fall down three flights of stairs without even hurting myself. And Michelle says it's 250 pounds of pop, people. What is that? Because you've been framed as italicized and and it's capitalized. So I'm assuming this is like a television show, but is it something that like you're, it, you're trying to like fake a lawsuit or something? Um, Ashley says, you know, America's Funniest Home Videos or whatever it's called. Yes. Oh, so she... I see. So when she says faking it, what she, because when it, she says you've been framed, I'm thinking it's framed like you frame somebody for murder. You frame somebody for negligence and that they're doing something to, to sort of, you know, try and get some, but I'm like, how is that a TV show if you're admitting you're, okay, so you've been framed is, it's more like, you've been caught on camera is, is what that is meant to be. Okay. I see. I see. So basically they're going to pretend it's a funny accident that they just happened to catch on camera when in fact the whole thing was just them faking it and they get paid for the videos. I didn't know. And maybe they don't, but I didn't know America's funniest home videos paid people to use their videos. And that is really if it's true, it makes a lot of sense how they got so much content. And I think about it and how much I loved America's Funniest Home Videos when I was a kid. I think, I mean, it was a phenomenon for a reason. And how the internet just completely sort of eradicated shows like that. And that's not to say that it's impossible. Like, they still do make them, I think. But how much more difficult it must be to pull off when by the time something goes to air, a video has circulated already, probably very quickly on the internet, you know? 
Um, but yeah, America's Funniest Home Videos, the ones that as a kid always like upset me the most because there was a lot of ones of dudes getting uh, hit in the junk either because they like were trying to walk on a rail and they fell on their junk or because they were like playing softball with a little kid who hit the ball right into their junk. But the ones that always turned up repeatedly were huge wedding cakes that toppled over and or somebody fell into them. Oh my God, you guys, that gives me such anxiety. Like I cannot express to y'all. And uh, I was thinking about it because Owen and my anniversary is coming up on Sunday. I can't believe it, you guys. We're going to have been married a year. I feel like our wedding just happened. And we saved the top tier of the wedding cake to eat on the anniversary and deep freeze the way that you do. And uh, I was thinking about some various things I have seen of people in Am I the Asshole on Reddit who had folks who like fucked their wedding cakes up. And if I didn't have that top tier for my anniversary, how pissed I would be. These cakes, I mean, my cake was very small because I had a small wedding and the ones that you see in Funniest Home Videos that get knocked over, I mean, my God, they're like seven tiers. I mean, taller than a man were they to be sat on the floor. Just, I, there is no way I could like deal with the person again who fucked my cake up. I just couldn't do it. It would be over. Our relationship would be dead. Um, oh, Candace says my dad submitted to America's Funniest Videos once and we got some tiny amount. Okay, cool. Um, so anyway... This is when uh, Claire, she jumps in and is like, isn't, aren't we going to address the elephant in the room? And I just want to mention this actress. Um, what is her, the actress's name? N Nicola Coughlin. I hope I'm saying that right. This girl is in Bridgerton, which is, uh, eh, it's fine. And she is a character that is so similarly like shy and sort of I, I hesitate to call Claire shy that's not even right the right word but the whole energy that she has here versus in Bridgerton is so different and I'm really interested to see other stuff that she does because I feel like she is quite good and coming back from the last time I saw her I think was in Bridgerton to seeing her here I'm like, oh, right. Wow. This is a different person. Um, oh, Ashley says it's pronounced Cochlin. Is it? I can't understand these things, man. What is up with consonants? And they're all over the place. It is. There is too much happening with the GH. I mean, Ash, Ashlick. <laughs> Ashlick Ann. Is that how, like, you know, what? G-H is, is too many different ways. I don't... Anyway, this is just English, I suppose. Or not. Um, but yeah, it turns out that they are going to be getting their scores back for a test that I am sort of equating with like the SATs. Um, it says GCSEs. And if you fail your GCSEs, the school won't take you back. I don't want to have to make new friends from scratch is what she's concerned about. Because she is like, oh, I'm not worried about me. I know I passed. I am worried that y'all didn't. And now I'm going to be moving on without you. And along with all of the schoolwork that I'm also going to have to be doing, I now have to recreate a social life from nothing, which frankly is a very valid concern to have. I really appreciated this. And I love that her concern is not about her own grades in the way that say like a Hermione's concern would be. It's she is fully aware of her own abilities. That is not the problem. They are the problem. And this just cracked me up so bad. Um, Ashley says it's a state exam that everyone in the country takes. Okay. And they don't accept you back at school or is it like she, cause that's what she says, but is it more like you don't get to go on to the next grade and you have to stay back a grade or is it be because like, is this a private school that they're going to like, do, can a private school chuck you out if you don't have a grade high enough? 
because, uh, you know, they, we have SATs in the United States and they're a major factor in getting into like, you know, universities and colleges. But you, no matter how bad you do on an SAT, it has no impact on whether you stay in a public school or not. You're still going to finish out your year and that's going to be a guarantee no matter what. So the way this is structured is very different sounding and the idea like i'm i'm sort of imagining what she's saying is just that they'll be like held back a year but even if that were true they could still have a social life so i don't know um and she is is not sure that the rest of you are going a uh, uh, rest of them are going to be able to scrape by and aaron says something about how considerate that is of her in a very sarcastic tone but Claire doesn't get it. And it's like, no, I know I'm very considerate. And then we cut to the house. And there is an uh, anchor saying, once again, the maze was the focal point of a troubled peace process as Mo Molam. Mm, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. Uh, was part of a visit that had been variously described as mad or brave. And this is a, a Again, all of the stuff that they show on this is always things that actually happened. They're always referencing like true world events. But this is something I have no idea what was going on here. So uh, if Ashley wants to tell me or if Ashley wants to hand me a link and I'll go find out about it later, that's also fine. Um, but yeah, it's always I appreciate you, Ashley, being in the chats here for these moments where I'm just like, I don't I don't know. Um, let's see. Ashley says, I'm not sure because it's the UK system, but their education system is similar to ours. Here you've got a junior certification age 15 to 16 and a leaving certification 17 and 18. JC determines what subjects and levels you can do for LC. LC results translate to points and you need certain points to get certain college courses. That sounds quite intimidating, actually. Hmm. Um, and then Ashley follows up with, she was a British MP who was important for the Good Friday Agreement. Yes, apologies. Do not know what that is either. Highly, highly ignorant, Ashley. Stupid, dumb American here. Just uh, reporting for duty. Apologies on that. Doing my best. But I'm going to read up on it because I am... You know, it's not like this stuff tends to be a huge part of the plot, but I think it's good background. So, yeah, I will check into that a little bit more. Um, so we have um, Orla and Aaron's mothers and they are hanging out together. And uh, let's see, her name is Mary and it's Sarah is Orla's mother, right? Um. And they have the baby with him who I had totally forgotten about. But he, Jerry comes in and he is fit to be tied. He comes in, he's got groceries and he is yelling about how somebody is a psychopath who has outstayed his welcome. I love this so much, you guys. Um, oh, Ashley in the chat says agreement to not going uh, to not going back and forth, killing each other in Northern Ireland. It's why there's not still open warfare up north. OK, cool. Um, so he's saying this is so fun to me because of, you know, all of, I for those who aren't aware, um, I have had quite a week of like taking in a litter of puppies and they all got sick with Parvo and less than half of them survived and it has been a very uh hectic and strenuous time but in that time owen who had been very against keeping one of the puppies has decided that she that he wants to keep one after all because one of them is very frail and wanted uh, some extra attention and babying that has wound up endearing him to us quite a bit so I love this because the whole episode is about Joe with this cat 
Seamus is his name, right? Who is leaving dead animals on their doorstep. Dead frogs, dead pigeons, dead mouse. And I love how every time Jerry says one of the things that this cat is guilty of, because Joe is standing there with Seamus in his arms. Every time Jerry makes another accusation, Joe takes a step toward him and Jerry like backs up. It's a very aggressive scene and the defensiveness that he feels about his cat. This is a thing I just love to see, especially when it is grown men and cats. Men will be, it, there's a weird sort of like association between cats and femininity in our culture that leads a lot of guys to thinking that if they like cats, that it means they are somehow less masculine. So a dude who is ready to throw down for a cat to begin with, I am going to be on their side just by default because that's them just not giving a shit about that sort of toxic nonsense. And then the fact that it is crystal clear that what Jerry is accusing Seamus of is true. Pretty much everybody can tell it's true. And it isn't until way later that like, and, and the whole thing happens with poor Fluffy that they all are like, look, Joe, obviously this is what's going on. But he is so prepared to deny, deny, deny. And I admire that. I really do. I, I respect this. There's a whole like um, thread of photos that you can see in different like shares on Facebook of men who allegedly didn't want the cat and then them snuggling with the cat having been like totally won over. And that, of course, is adorable in its way. But. Joe, it's apparently Seamus was like a stray or feral and Joe took him in. And so this isn't even him being won over by a cat he didn't have interest in. This is a cat that it looks like he went and found and took in completely on his own that the rest of the family doesn't really have anything to do with. And that speaks to his like character as well, being so willing to, you know, put it on the line for this little guy. And I appreciate Jerry's like irritation about it all, but also Jerry, what are you proposing? He wants to just kick the cat out. Jerry, I tend to be on your side more often than not because Joe is deeply unreasonable and obviously personally does not like you. And so he makes trouble because he doesn't like you. But in this case, having just come off a week where there were several people who said things to me in such a way as to suggest that maybe I should just give up and let the puppies die. I am very sensitive to anyone suggesting that maybe you should just give up on something that is an animal that is alive. I am not here for it. So I appreciate your position, Jerry, of irritation at finding these dead animals. But also, what does it cost you, really? This cat is a cat. That's what they do. And it's just part of the deal. And if you are this precious about it, then I guess you're just going to have to put blinders on when you step out your front door so that you don't see the offending items. I, I don't know. It's all I, I can tell you. Um, uh, Ashley says it's also f a feral cat that's warmed up to him enough that he's happy being held by Joe. Yes. And again, the fact that it's Joe, like, I don't know. Joe feels a little feral himself. It just makes sense to me. This works. Um, and I'm going to jump ahead a little bit with that whole storyline because eventually Fluffy turns up and Fluffy is somebody's pet rabbit, white rabbit that evidently Seamus killed and dragged to the door. They find his body and this pet bunny has like a collar with a tag and all it's very clearly a pet also quite large like taking this animal down i'm not saying it would have been like real hard but it's a real different level than a sparrow or something and 
this is the the moment where everybody, even his own daughter, is like, Dad, the cat took this rap. Like, you've got to put a bell on him. That has been the main, like, bone of contention is the cat isn't exactly the problem. It's that he can hunt. And if we just made some sort of, like, you know, precaution that allowed them to hear him coming, it would be easier for the animals to escape and we wouldn't have this problem and we could still be caring for the cat which is actually for those who are not aware cats do as a group have a really devastating effect on ecosystems because of their hunting and because of how quickly they multiply if they are not spayed and neutered so if you do have a cat that you allow to go in and out of your house do get them a collar with a bell i mean yeah Are they going to be able to hunt as successfully? No. But does that matter when they can come home to like a bowl of kibble and fresh water set out for them? Also, no. And it helps save ecosystems. If you do the research, it's wild how much cats affect it. Um, But also really just don't do indoor outdoor cats. It's I understand not wanting to keep them cooped up in the house, but it's just not a great idea. And there's a lot of studies about that as well. Anyway. So when they have tried to get him to do the bell thing, he refused. And in the end, he does cop to that. And we see Seamus, like, obviously a bit irritated at it. But that is the fucking deal. When you become a domesticated animal, you got to get used to not being able to do whatever the fuck you want. Um, <laughs> Candace in the chat, my cats will never see the outdoors. Yeah, they. It, it's I have growing up had a lot of indoor outdoor cats. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying that it always went badly. Like sometimes it was totally fine, but there are a lot of things that can go wrong in a lot of directions via health wise, environment wise. And, um, it's just a better idea for the safety of your animals to keep them inside. So this, uh, results in Joe deciding that the only thing they can do is dispose of the body. They've got to hide the body. And I love the scene where he goes to find a spot to bury it and he's with Jerry and he says, this is a perfect spot. And Jerry's like, here, have you buried a lot of bodies? And he says, no, but I've often thought of what I would do if I had to bury one. And Jerry just has a moment of sitting alone in the car after Joe gets out processing that because it feels very clearly like a threat it's very much about him there's no denying that um (laughs) so he uh they dig a hole and bury fluffy and when they come home there is a man and his i think like granddaughter and he knows good and goddamn well that seamus killed her pet bunny like there's no proof because there is no body but apparently the entire neighborhood is aware of what a fucking chaos monster Seamus is and he he, I love when he talks about it because it's they use the kind of language that folks would use if they were discussing like a, a problematic child like a a kid that's showing serial killer tendencies and they're like, well, you know, it starts with small animals, but then they start to move up and get tired of that and start to do it. And the whole like people are beginning to talk, Joe. I just really enjoyed the whole framing of this as like, we're all like your cat is potentially in danger because we have all grown aware what he is doing. And unless you've got your eye on him at all times. I wouldn't be totally sure that he's going to wind up okay. So maybe you just want to think about what you're allowing him to get away with. And I love, he is so unafraid of Joe because Joe with Jerry, he is so intimidating, you know, and this actor, I love him so much. He's so good, but there is a real sense to him of like, you do not want to fuck with this man. However, dude with his granddaughter here isn't afraid of Joe and is like, I've got my eye on you and stares him down. And I was like, I have to give some respect to this man. You look at Joe with that expression. I'm impressed with it. Like 
Joe feels like a threatening guy to me. And if you are this willing to step to him and in defense of like your granddaughter as well, another thing that makes me like see points for you. I just really appreciated it. I liked it. Um, Ooh, Ashley says, I work with a microchipping company and I love the stray dog calls and being able to give info to get them home. But I dread the cat ones because the cat is never okay. Oh, I didn't know that. If you love your cat, keep them indoors. Yeah. He's the guy who played Barris and Selmy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know. But it like, and honestly, Barris and Selmy in Game of Thrones, he was fine. I didn't like, whatever. He is so much more fun here. What a delight. Um... So that's pretty much that plot. He winds up capitulating and getting the bell for Seamus and apologizing to the cat. Uh, but with the girls, they we have a wonderful scene of them at a video store. And you guys, it is really wild to think about how different our social scene is these days as compared to what it used to be like. There's just, because of the internet, a lot more is done in one room. You know, you can like have your phone and create a bunch of TikToks and, and whatever in a single room provided that you've got space, maybe costume changes and nobody cares if you're making noise, whatever. And that can be the way kids spend their whole afternoon. And it's like still super fun and active and engaging for them. And they can also interact with their friends via their devices. But in the 90s, we had fucking video stores. We had the mall or if you were in a really backwoods area like I was, and it wasn't so much backwoods as like just lower income, you had to drive a bit of a way to get to a mall. So the best we could do was the Walmart, which it wasn't even a super Walmart at that time. It was like, a, you know, the smaller beginner Walmart. And we would get dropped off at Walmart and left there for literal hours because there was nothing else to do. And we would just go to the makeup aisle and fuck around with makeup. We would go to the home goods aisle. We would probably be given like maybe five or $10 and we were allowed to buy whatever. And it would be one parent's job to drop us off and they would make a deal with the other parents to come and pick us up later. And it was so boring. It was so boring. It just really was. And seeing them hanging out here at this video store, I love when they head out and uh, Jerry says to Aaron, like, no more old filth, I think is what he calls it. And she's like, what? And he accuses her of renting American Gigolo, but it's clear her mom and aunt were the ones who rented it. And when he reprimands her and she denies it and his wife is immediately like, just let her go. He turns around and looks at her and is like, oh, OK, I get it. Um, so yeah, they're looking at the, uh, <laughs> Michelle is looking at Braveheart and she says this Scottish drag queen takes on the entire British army. And when James is like, he wasn't a drag queen. She says he's wearing a skirt and has a full face of foundation on him. James delightful. So here comes this dude, Dennis. Now, I know we have seen him before. I can't remember, but I think he worked at the like little uh, corner store that they went to. Right. And they fucked around with him. Um, <laughs> Ashley says, meanwhile, I was literally daydreaming about that kind of a summer holiday. I grew up in the middle of nowhere. One hour walk to the nearest store. So I basically had a summer of house arrest every year. Oh God. That sounds very tedious. Apologies. Um, the sweet shop. Okay. Yeah. 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 And I love him. He gets so mad at this kid for not rewinding. And the kid gives him the finger before walking out. It is just wonderful. And there is like, 
I think this this could be a pretty good ongoing joke. If every season there's a sort of new moment of like us seeing a business that sort of epitomizes the era and he's always the one that's working there. I really want to mention too all of the movie posters and covers that we see in the background because I am confident there are going to be some references here that I'm not getting. We've got Solitude of Solace, Death Code 9, Son of Chuck E, and it's Chuck and space, and then the letter E, and at the bottom it says kill and kill again. And then there's Obedience Boy. And Obedience Boy has like an ice cream cone smashed onto his face. And it looks like maybe there's like an age warning on it. I can't tell. But that for some reason is giving jackass. And I don't know if that's it at all. But I really would love to just go slowly through this entire scene and look at every movie that they're like. There, <laughs> there is a heat wave hell is one of the ones that there is multiple posters for and like a standee as well. I don't know. I just, this is fascinating to me. Like it must be really fun to design this kind of thing for props, you know? So anyway, he's like, are you guys going to rent something or not? He's getting very aggressive. He, and when they say like they're reading the backs he says it's not a library to which James says, well, it is. It's a, it's a video library. And he screams, get out. So they begin to leave. And they run into uh, Sister Michael, Sister George Michael. And when they ask what happened, because she is on crutches, they get the response you should see the other guy with a genuine little like smirk. And I think she is joking, but I also am like, is she, I don't know what she did. I don't know if we're ever going to find out what she did, but I am going to just go ahead with, she actually got in like a fight with somebody and I am fine with that. I'm just going to go with that. That's fine. Um, and they begin to talk to her about how they're renting a movie to get their minds off their scores. And she's very vigilant about, I don't want to talk to you. I'm not interested. And they won't listen and they keep fucking pushing it. So they eventually find out that she already has the results of their tests and knows whether they passed or not. And she tells them with deep solemnity, enjoy the time you have left which of course leads them to panic. And I knew as soon as I heard her say this, that they were going to then try and break into the school to get the results, which is obviously Michelle's idea. So they go to the school. We have a delightful sequence of them trying to figure out how they're going to break in before finally Orla just tries the door and it turns out it's not locked at all to begin with. And when they go inside, there are two men already there. And I honestly had no idea until the guy started talking about how his name is Hans, that this was not a legit thing. You know, like apparently I can be very gullible also. And... I also think having a husband whose family owns like a commercial cleaning business and they frequently do their shifts in the middle of the fucking night. I am just much more prepared to believe that somebody that's in a place at night is just doing a job that sucks. But as they're like walking in here, fucking James is filming it all, which winds up being a bit of an issue later. And they run into these guys and the dudes eventually manage to convince these kids that they are here for legitimate reasons and also that they need some help. And because the kids are feeling so guilty, they are more than happy to assist as long as they don't get in trouble. 
So this dude, Hans, offers them some money for their troubles. They are like, no, no, no. But of course, Michelle grabs it and is like, thank you, Hans, which thank you, Michelle. And these dudes take off with all of the new computers that were just bought by the school. And I... (laughs) What happens next? The kids are all standing there. Claire starts to realize that doesn't make a lot of sense, actually. They were here at night, and those computers were pretty new. Did they say where they were taking them? I actually think maybe we helped them to rob the school, did we? And then we have this fucking, like, SWAT team descend on the school, literally, like, repelling out of helicopters kinds of of descend. Like... And they wind up getting taken in. I, this moment is so wild. And look, would this happen this way? Absolutely not. Am I mad at it? No. Because what I like to think of this scene is that it doesn't actually go this way. It's simply this way in their heads. Do you know what I'm saying? Like probably a cop car pulled up or two maybe. And in their memory of their fevered brains, it was like a squadron of people. And they get taken in and questioned in a scene that I think a lot of us might have seen in the previews. um, Because this almost entirely the scene was in a preview. But I had pretty much forgotten it by the time it rolled up again. So it was fine. And Liam Neeson is here. And I got to say, y'all, I have had such a crush on Liam Neeson. And, you know, there have been some revelations in the past few years that uh, he had some extremely racist views and was actually kind of like fucked up for a bit. It seems like he's learned his lesson and grown, but it is certainly something that was quite disturbing to hear about. So, It's been tempered some, but I was obsessed with him. There was just something about him that was so, uh, the, the sort of like quietness of a lot of the characters that he played and the intensity of him and the look of him where he has this like broken nose. He's got the vibe of a guy who's like been in fights and is still very grounded. Oh my God. I cannot tell y'all enough. It was like, and he still got it as far as I am concerned. In this scene, Michelle just being like, nice uniform. I was like, honestly, girl, you have good taste. Like, is this man old enough to be your literal grandfather? Yes. Does it matter to me? No, I get it. I really get it. So the curls, of course, and James are all flipping out because They know what it looks like. The only thing they've got going for them is that there's no possible way they personally could have like moved those computers that quickly and and they're gone. So it's pretty clearly it wasn't them, but it really looks quite bad. And they're all they're asking for a lawyer. Fucking Aaron keeps talking about for the tape and he has to remind her there's no tape and she clearly like does not believe him. And they conference together by turning around in their chairs and decide that they're going to call in the big guns to wear down the police. Um, and I'm, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. There is a moment where they're talking about how they are being treated unfairly because they are Fenians, which I am going to guess as is is catholic is that correct oh no i'm looking up umbrella term for the irish republican brotherhood and their affiliate in the united states the finian brotherhood irish secret society but then they talk about catholics as well in the same breath so it feels like those things must be quite closely related um Oh, Ashley is saying, oh, basically Fenian equals Irish. Is, is he not Irish? 
I thought he was as well. Is he British? I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry again. My, my apologies. Dumb American. Um, identifying as Irish says Ashley. Okay. So they have this like essential back and forth where he winds up sort of, I really enjoyed seeing this getting rather defensive uh, about the fact that they don't. Oh, okay. Ashley's saying Protestants identify as British Catholics identify as Irish for the most part. Do you know, I don't think I knew that at all. I didn't realize that's like the way it went, but oh, duh, 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 doy. That makes such sense. I just, it being that simple, I mean, it's not simple, but you get what I'm saying. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. But yeah, he gets very defensive. Um, I love when Aaron says, if your organization isn't prejudiced, then you wouldn't mind telling us how many Catholic officers are serving in it at this time. And there's a moment where he, there's like a long silence. And finally he says, if you count the Jewish fellow three, um, it's just a, a very fun bit of them having to be like, uh, having to admit, all right, yeah, I know this doesn't look great for us. But then they decide to call in Colm, who, uh, for those who need their memory refreshed, is the man who can talk to you for absolute ages without saying anything. And I have met this man quite recently. He was the one that was in custody of the puppies before I took them. And it, it is a very difficult thing with people like this. Holy shit. And it is so great because eventually one of the officers gets called away and Liam Neeson is like, please don't leave me. And he says, it's every man for himself, sir. And he has just been on and on without actually answering any of the questions. In fact, he doesn't remember what they even asked the guy. Um, so eventually he has bought them so much time that somebody comes into the room with stills from the uh, security footage and it turns out that they have on camera the dudes who were taking all of these. And, and the guy is like looking directly at the camera, by the way. So I don't know. Did he see the cameras were there and, and just not think it mattered or what? But either way, the kids are off the hook. It is very fun. I loved this scene so much. And I love Aaron. We can go. And he says, Oh, yes, please, please go. And for the love of suffering, Jesus, take him with you. So we go then to the next morning and the girls are getting their test results and they're freaking out. And it turns out they all passed. But Erin is extremely agitated to discover that she has the same grades as Orla. And I can this is so fucking funny to me there's this moment where she where Aaron is just like that doesn't make any sense how can we have the same scores and uh and sister Michael says Orla just does really well at exams despite the fact that she obviously you know is subnormal <laughs> and she says that and Orla and her mom smile at her and say oh thank you and Claire says you said we failed and she says I didn't say you failed I implied you failed bit of a slow day <laughs> oh I love her I love her to death and this gets interrupted by the entry of a police officer who found a camera in the computer lab and says we're going to go spin through the footage now and it ends with Michelle just yelling fuck a doodle do and that is the end of the episode so yeah just so happy to be here again I'm delighted um, Ashley in the chat says I wrote a more detailed explanation in the Dairy Girls no spoilers so if you have a few minutes it might be a bit more informative thank you Ashley and yeah for those listening uh, no spoilers, Dairy Girls channel in the Discord if you are interested in checking that out. So that way everybody else can also be on the same page as me. Um, Candace says, the nun is my favorite character, hands down. Oh, no question. 
it's just one of those things. It's like not fair. But any time that you are going to have an older, no nonsense woman who doesn't take shit and fucks with people it, 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 in any show. And the one that, of course, comes to mind for me is Maggie Smith's character in uh, Downton Abbey. But also what's her face in Gilded Age? Um, Ag- is it Agatha? Agnes? Either way, you can't not have them be your favorite character like it's just that's just that's just gonna be what happens it's just the most fun somebody who's like old enough that their filter just isn't there and maybe never was but certainly has worn away and that everybody is a little too afraid of to really like call them out or stand up to them in any significant way i mean it is just so good it's so good so yeah all right Well, I'm going to wrap up. Thank you guys again so much for listening. Thank you again very much to Ashley for commissioning the episode. And until next time, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.